Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Simon Longstaff. I welcome you all here tonight to the City Recital Hall. Tonight, we're debating the topic that privacy is not for children. We ask ourselves things like, should we monitor our children's internet and social media use to protect them from genuine risks, from online predators, from bullies, that there might be non-consensual photographic and information sharing? And do we do that to protect them even though it might put at risk the trust that exists or should exist between parents and their children. So that's what we're really talking about tonight with a particular focus on this world in we look at the motion that privacy is not for children. And to open the debate, please welcome the first speaker for the affirmative, Susan McLean. Well, thanks very much. And I think the thing that we need to all understand is that cyberspace is a public place. It's not a private space. You can have a notion of privacy and security, but it's not real. There is a perception of anonymity online that is just that, a perception. It is not real. Because everything you do online is permanent. It can be traced. And of course, that means that there is no way or no place to hide. If you ask a young person, what the privacy means to them or what is privacy, by and large they will say, hiding it from mum and dad. They have no concept that it's out there, it's permanent, and you can't get it back. Whilst in the real world, parents protect their children enormously, where they go, who they go with, they have rules and boundaries that often goes out the window when we're talking about the internet. The internet and cyberspace brings the world into a young person's life, everyone good, bad, and in between. And whilst we're not so much fussed about the good, it's the bad and in between that we're concerned about. The young child that sits alone on their device, unsupervised, unfiltered internet access, talking to God knows who. The impact of that is enormous. Prevention is always better than cure. And whilst a young person might cry that it is an invasion of privacy for a parent to look at what they're doing online, it is simply being a good parent. If you don't know where your child is, what they're doing and who they're doing it with, then you can't adequately parent them in the digital space. Children are digital natives without a shadow of a, bat, shadow of a doubt. Technical skill, up here. Cognitive and brain development languishes at about knee level. There's a massive gap between what children can do and what they understand. We know for a girl, the brain sort of kicks into gear around early to mid-20s, and if you have a son so close to the age of 30 for them, that's often with the wind behind them on a good day. So there is an enormous amount of time and effort and energy needed to ensure that young people have safe and positive experiences when they're online. When we talk about the sort of people that want to latch on to children, we're talking about the groomers, the predators, that are terribly, terribly skilled at what they do. Not a week goes by that I do not take a report from a child somewhere in Australia about the fact that the nice person they were talking to that they thought were nice, seemed nice, sound nice, and appeared nice, turned out to be having the wrong motives. Where were the parents of that child? How did this happen? Because what police can't do is catch every bad person out there. And even if they do, the damage is done. You can't undo the damage. The grooming process in particular is particularly quick. Two cases I was recently involved in, within four weeks, two young girls had stripped naked and shared photos online on the premise of one, a free bikini, and number two, an appearance on a television show. Good kids, smart kids from good schools and good homes get sucked in. Naked selfies are never, ever taken at the kitchen table. And the old adage of getting tech out of bedrooms is as relevant today as it ever was before. A lot of people say that it doesn't matter anymore that you should let children do what they want, learn and explore and hope for the best. But there's nowhere else in life that we do that. We monitor, we guide, we supervise, and we're there with our children in all areas of their lives. The online world is no different. You must be there with them. You must offer guidance and support. 
whilst accepting your technical skill by and large does not even remotely come close to that of your child's. But your cognitive and brain development, your maturity, your life experiences and your skills matched up with the tech savviness of your children is where you're going to reap the rewards. 22 years ago, I took my first report of cyberbullying when a group of year eight girls posted on an internet sex chat room the personal details of a girl they no longer liked. We had to move that family into a motel that afternoon and then a rental property because we couldn't stop the stream of men knocking on the door looking for that 13-year-old girl and her very kind offer of free sex. So the concept of privacy online simply does not exist. We cannot expect young children to be able to make these decisions on their own, nor should we allow them. Technology is a wonderful tool. Without a shadow of a doubt, there are enormous benefits. But we must understand that it is an incumbent upon us as an adult, be it interested member of the community, teacher, parent, carer, grandparent, aunt, uncle, cousin, or anyone with an interest in young people, that we work together to ensure that young people are safe and protected online. That simply does not happen if you open the doors of the internet and hope for the best. Young children deserve better. They deserve people that are interested in them, deserve people that understand what they're going through. Do not demonize technology based on a few negative issues, but appreciate and focus on the benefits it gives rather than negative it provides. But we must always be aware that no matter what you think or what your intention is, it is a public place. You're only as secure online as the people you hang out with. There is nothing to stop anyone taking, sharing, reposting anything you do online. So whilst your intention might have been a small audience, the fact that you end on, up on the front page of a national newspaper, there's not much you can do about it. So making sure children understand the reality, not sunshine and happiness, because it's not always that. Parents give their children devices. They must also know how they work, where they go, how they're used, passwords and passcodes. It is not an invasion of privacy, it is being a parent. I'm Sula Dreyfus. I'm the first speaker for the negative here tonight. Now, what we want to show tonight is that privacy is for children, at least some of the time. In our model, both in this debate and in the universe, a perfect universe, is to give some privacy to children at a gradually increasing level as they mature. We're not arguing it should be a free-for-all. We're not saying that every eight-year-old should have unfettered access to the internet. But even eight-year-olds should be allowed to have a degree of privacy, even if it's just a whispered secret to a friend in a play yard, or even a private online chat with a parentally approved classmate from school. We suggest that the other side must actually prove that children should not be entitled to any privacy if they're to win this debate. There are arguments against privacy, as the first speaker has eloquently set out. And I would actually group them into a basket that she, she put set forward today of, it's a dangerous world out there. And yes, it's true, it is a dangerous world out there, which is exactly why we need to spend our time teaching and training our children how to handle privacy, to arm them with good judgment and with wisdom for online. We cannot spy on them as a substitute for teaching them this. That breaks the trust with the parent or the school, and that trust is needed if the, if the children are actually to listen to their guidance uh, people on this. Good judgment is a learned skill, and it takes time. Parents often use monitoring children online as a substitute for this harder task of teaching them the skills to monitor that, the, the skills to think before, before you type. Most parents are time poor. Reading their children's every text message and email takes time and energy, and that time and energy would be better spent actually teaching their children the skills to do it themselves, to do so safely. Children need to practice at least some time that is surveillance-free from their parents online um, in order to prepare for the day when they can fly from the nest, fly free, and have no surveillance at all, well, other than from George Brandis and the NSA. And that means giving them a measure of privacy well before their 18th birthday. 
This leads to my first major argument. Privacy isn't just about secrecy, it's about autonomy. Privacy is core to our sense of liberty and independence. So learning how to handle privacy is learning how to have independence. It is a necessary life skill in a free and open society. It lets us control information about ourselves. And this is why children need privacy in order to successfully develop independence and become an adult. Practice free from surveillance makes perfect. My second point is that a population under surveillance, constant surveillance, learns to lie. Surveillance creates an incentive. You must lie in order to get the things you want to if the people watching you don't agree with you. Do we really want our children to be liars? Researchers have seen this in the Hawthorne effect where they watch participants in research studies and they change their behavior when they're being observed. Well, our worthy opponents might say, great, if the teenager knows the parent is watching, then the teenager will stop sexting. Maybe. But actually, what you see is often that change is only temporary. It reflects how someone behaves in an artificial library, not in an uh, artificial laboratory, not in real life. And once the lab rat gets out onto the footpath in the sunshine, he does as he wishes. In fact, while we've been teaching our teenagers to lie and avoid breaches to privacy, they probably fail, we've probably failed in our aim in spying as well, since most teenagers today are more technically literate than the parents who try and spy on them. And this leads to my third point. Privacy is a basic human right. It's recognized by the UN Convention of Rights on the Child. Quote, no child should be subject to arbitrary interference with his or her privacy or correspondence. It's recognized in law with protections to a child's medical records, sometimes even from the pa parent, and even if the child is a baby. But that's just a piece of paper, right? UN documents, they're just a piece of paper. Well, maybe. There are different types of privacy. We think about privacy as personal privacy, privacy as communications privacy. Parents sometimes use apps on phones to track the location of their children. This sort of privacy is interesting because it's a partial privacy. Children can turn the phone off, they can turn the app off, and the app is sometimes only an approximation anyway. So it's only a partial privacy. But there are more perfect ways, more permanent ways of involuntary privacy. Why we could just put microchips and a cellular receiver and battery, you know, with an ankle strap on the children that can only be unlocked with parents. That kind of seems, voila, like an instant solution. You would always know where your parent were. The wayward 14-year-old would never be able to get away. It's a great idea, right? Not a great idea. And the fact is, we don't see thousands of children around Australia with GPS tracking bracelets and microchips. Does this mean that Australian parents don't love their children? I mean, doesn't spying on a child mean we love them? No, it means we're stalking them. And that's a big difference. Tracking your children with that sort of technology, that sort of involuntary technology, has a high yuck factor. And I could just see it in the audience a minute ago. People were like, ugh. And most parents don't do that because they feel it's wrong. Well, hold on to that feeling. Because it's your internal ethical barometer talking. It feels like overreach, and it is. And the reason it feels like overreach is because at some level, most of us instinctively know that privacy is a basic human right, just as the UN tells us it is, that piece of paper. And the sort of involuntary tracking I've just been describing violates that kind of intrinsic human right to privacy, even if you believe in small things like letting your child to close the door to their room, to have a little bit of privacy. It's a recognition of that right, even in some small way. One of the best things about privacy is that by recognizing it's an individual's right, even a child's right, it means the parent must negotiate an agreed arrangement if there is to be monitoring. And that means the child gets to set some terms as well, and he or she re retains some human dignity, and then in doing so, it means the child can also make the parent think before they snoop on the child, and that's a good thing. So for all these reasons, privacy is for children. Not all of it, not all at once, but enough to prepare them for the future. Thank you. The opposition would have us believe that privacy is an actual fact online, and the reality is WWW stands for World Wide Web. Everything that young people put online is able to be tracked and traced. And whilst it is 
brilliantly pointed out in the Convention of the Rights of the Child, the right to privacy, online predators don't recognise that right. Our young people absolutely need our guidance in this space. And it's completely impractical to monitor every single text. I've got three teenagers. It's impossible. Completely impractical to monitor every single word. But they do need us to guide them through and for the baseline know that there is no such thing as privacy online. When I go into schools and I talk to young people about their internet use, I teach them if something is personal, if something is private, you keep it offline because there is absolutely no way that once that goes online, that that stays personal. There is no guarantee. Brain developmentally, as Susan rightly pointed out, takes a long time for the cognitive process to kick in. Around 12, 13, when most teens are getting their devices, their hormones are going off the Richter, their emotional brain is the part of their brain that fires up at every available moment. Their prefrontal cortex responsible for their decision making, for, for actually taking that step back and thinking about the fourth, thinking ahead about what could happen if I post this nasty comment online, if I share this particular image, if I, it just doesn't kick in. The prefrontal cortex is lagging behind. We know that from science. When I talk to teenagers, 12, 13, 14 year olds, I'm teaching them that there's three things that they can do to help them through that process because we know that the brain is like a muscle. So it must be exercised. It must be activated in a way that we're trying to get that prefrontal cortex to kick in. And that requires two other things. The pause before you post, before you do anything. Remember the pause. If you're emotional, if you're feeling hungry, mad, sad, bad, pause. Remember the pause. And then they need relationships. They need the solid guidance of parents and carers around them to teach them how to exercise their brain in a rational way, how to remember the pause. But we can't even begin to do that if we're starting on the premise that privacy is a thing online. We have to start baseline and talk to them about privacy is not for kids, particularly when it comes to online use. Recently, I had the benefit of sitting alongside Alexander Rhodes, who is the head of NoFap. NoFap is a new online forum emerged out of his own need because he had seen internet pornography at a very young age. And when he was about 23, 24, he realized that uh, he was addicted to online porn. And he had now has an online forum for hundreds of thousands of young men and women who are realizing that they have very real problems from seeing internet pornography. And sitting over dinner, he said, the one thing that would have made the difference in my world as an 11 and a 12 year old is not being allowed to be in my bedroom where everything was kept private. If somebody had have stepped in, if my parents had have taken an active interest on what I was doing, how much gaming, uh, how much time I was spending gaming, how much time my addictive brain was firing up, it was a very easy process to go on to online pornography. So the adolescent brain left to its own devices to say, you know what, you have your space, you have your privacy, no monitoring, is the brain that becomes very easily entrapped. I'll give you another example of a young 13-year-old who had been taught that online privacy was not for children. And it's been said that uh, within four weeks, a predator can approach a young person and convince them to share pictures. I'd like to propose it's as quickly as 20 minutes. In this example that I share with you, 
She had befriended this person who was probably 19. And he starts at 6.03 p.m. Hey, gorgeous. You're awesome. I'm sinking in your deepness. You are so amazing. At about 6.15, he's saying, ah, oh, would you like for Dick to fight pussy? And she's like, ha, 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 LOL. He's going, you do know what Dick is, don't you? And she's like, yeah, well, I'm not 12. She was 13. And within 19 minutes, this particular predator was asking her, please, oh my God, tell me it's shaved, will you? Will you tell me it's shaved because I'd love to see it. I'd love to see a picture. Less than 20 minutes, that girl was groomed. Thankfully, she had learnt that online privacy was not for children and she went to her parents and she had that shut down. That groomer was blocked. Online privacy is not for children. But the reality is most parents don't know what's going on. I regularly run parent talks on easy access to pornography. This last particular talk, I had a parent come up to me and said, I had no idea that there is absolutely no filters for pornography. I thought that it was perhaps behind a paywall. I thought that at least maybe it wasn't available at the click of a button. I challenge you, or maybe I shouldn't, go home, Google porn, see how quickly that comes up. You cannot educate a child out of the trauma of seeing what is available now. Hardcore, aggressive, violent pornography. Yes, we need more education. Yes, we need to guide our children along the road to, to become responsible di digital citizenships. But we have to start from the premise that online, that, that privacy is not for children. Everything that we post online is available. Thank you. Good evening, and I thank the affirmative side for making some very good points. Just raise the mic a little bit. Um, so look, what I want to say is that we are here to debate one simple proposition, and that is that privacy is not for children. So we are not debating whether there are risks online. We are not debating whether there are risks sharing personal information online. We are not debating whether parents ought to supervise and instruct their children in safe practices, but do so openly and transparently. What we're debating fundamentally is this. It's whether it's ever justified for parents or other carers to pry into the content of their children's personal communications, particularly without their children's knowledge. That is what we're debating tonight, and we should focus on that particular proposition. So, something I think that we all will agree with, the affirmative and the negative, is that children, indeed all individuals, uh, have a right to privacy online. They have a right to exercise their privacy when they are engaging in, as we've been told, this very public space. Isn't that the issue that has brought us here and has started this debate in the first place? So tonight I want to argue two primary points. Uh, the first thing is I think once we have a better understanding of what privacy actually is and what it means, then it becomes clear that children can and should have a right to privacy. Secondly, according to that definition that I'm about to give you, um, we can see that uh, they already do understand and they do exercise their right to privacy and they only need to be more empowered in this regard rather than disempowered. So what I want to do first of all is, is clarify this concept of privacy that we're using. Um, I think in far too many debates, they get mixed up and we talk across each other because we use vague or inconsistent terminology. And I think if there's one service that philosophy can provide, it's helping us find clarity around the concepts and the definitions that we use. So it seems to me that a very common uh, conception of privacy is simply this, the act of restricting access to personal information. I think that's the way we often use the term privacy, particularly if you think of an example of a very private person. That's often referred to as someone who's very concealing about their personal life. They don't reveal much about their personal life. 
But I don't think this is a very good conception or very good definition of privacy per se. I think it's just an application of it. I think a far better conception and a better definition of privacy is one offered by the philosopher uh, Alan Weston. So he describes privacy as the ability to determine for ourselves when, how, and to what extent information about us is communicated to others. So privacy is not just about restricting access to personal information, it's about the right to choose for ourselves how that information is shared. So a person who chooses to share a great deal with the world can still be a private person if they have the power and the control to share that information as they want. So privacy is fundamentally about agency and control. And under this conception, a breach of privacy is where we lose control over that information and our ability to share it or not to share it. So now, as I mentioned before, I think we all agree that everyone should have a right to privacy online. This is precisely the thing that many parents are afraid is being violated, which means that everyone also has a right to control what and how their personal information is distributed. In fact, one of the key skills that we want to instill into children is how to exert control and take control of their personal information. And we want them to understand the implications of sharing it in ways where they could lose that control. Now, we all agree that going online and sharing information can be risky. Now, this is precisely because if it's not managed carefully, we can lose control. But what that means is that young people, I would suggest, need to be empowered to take control over their personal information so they are not encouraged to share it in risky ways. Now, this will inevitably mean that parents will place restrictions on what their children can do online, and they will only loosen those restrictions when they gain in maturity or gain in proficiency, such as learning about the pause. I think that's a very good idea. But cannot this be done transparently and openly and in partnership with the children rather than imposed upon them from on high. So if we want children to have control over their personal information, parental intrusion, particularly covert intrusion, is robbing them of the very agency that we wish to instill in them. It's disempowering them. So the other point that I would like to make is that uh, we should be careful not to mistake a belief in greater transparency in how much it's appropriate to share online with a belief that someone does not value privacy. I think it's a fact today that children have grown up in a different kind of world to their parents. They are the digital natives, their parents are the digital immigrants. And so where their parents might believe that sharing very little is the norm and is appropriate, young people have grown up with things like social media, they've grown up uh, with, uh, with reality television, they've grown up hearing about the activities of their friends and their peers and celebrities. They understand that a little bit of transparency in their lives can be a good thing. Now, we should not mistake that belief in transparency for the idea they don't like or believe in privacy. Just because they believe in transparency doesn't mean they want to give up their control over their information. And the evidence shows that young people are taking control. In fact, 95% of 18 to 24-year-olds in Australia have checked or changed their privacy settings in Facebook. Only 62% of 35 to 54-year-olds around the age of their parents have done the same. Um, another study uh, that came out of the US showed that a majority of US teenagers expressed confidence in managing their Facebook settings. 60% of them kept their profiles private. 57% had decided not to post to social media because of possible consequences. 74% of them blocked individuals so information would not go to them. That is exerting control and they need help managing this, not to be disempowered. So look, we acknowledge that uh, there are risks online, as Susan has said, but we also can test the notion that invading a child's privacy is the solution to letting them handle those risks online. Thank you very much. I'm going to start this speech with a hypothetical. You're at home with your kid. She's 10 years old and it's the morning. You open the door to her room to wake her up. For breakfast, she reaches for the chocolate milk to pour over her sugary cereal, but you say, no, that's not healthy. You don't consent. She rolls her eyes and then uses normal milk. You drive her to school, and before she gets out of the car, you give her her signed permission slip for the excursion she's going on that day. 
You did consent to that. The common tie-in for all these moments is that as a parent, you are able and pretty much morally mandated to ask the question, is my child safe, when you make decisions about her. In this debate and in the world, that's the test for parental responsibility. So the day progresses. Your kid comes home from school using the school bus pass that you had to sign off on her having. She dumps her bag in the room, says a quick hello, and heads back into that room to fire up her laptop. For the opposition, this is where the hypothetical ends. Once the kid's face is hidden behind the thin bind of metal and glass that is her computer screen, she is hidden from the parent's realm of responsibility, too. The parent is powerless. On our side of the debate, it's different. We don't think the principle of ensuring their child is safe should be restricted to the physical world. We, will, we have suggested that just as privacy is not for children in the playground, in their bedroom, in their diet or their travels, it is not for children on their computer. It is normal and right for a parent to hold their child's hand when they face adversity in the real world. Here, we need parents to hold their children's hands too. Sulet wanted to talk about the yuck factor of invading your child's privacy. But the thing is, when you're deciding whether you're for or against this motion after our speeches, you have to measure that yuck against the tsunami of yuck that the online world brings. Tonight, make no mistake as to the severity of online abuse. And be prepared to realize that you're probably already getting it wrong. Only a sixth of parents accurately estimate the extent of internet abuse and cyberbullying. So maybe the people on the sides here are kind of getting it right, but for most of us here, you just have no clue the extent to which your children are, getting, are, are being harmed by the online world. Here are the stats. With children aged 10 to 17, one in five have been sexually solicited online. One in four have uncounted unwanted porn. 60% of teens have received an email or message from a stranger and half have communicated back. And the kicker, over 75% of internet crimes involving the sexual solicitation of children or exposure to unwanted pornography is not reported to police or parents. If you're mugged in a park, the first thing you do is call the police or get some help. Imagine feeling so isolated and alone online that you can never reach out even while you're being victimized and targeted. This debate is about how dangerous the online world is. Something in this equation has to give. Either it's gonna be a child's privacy or it's gonna be something more de se severe. If you think it's okay knowing where your child is and who they're with and when they'll be back home, then you should also think that privacy is not for children online, where the potential for abuse is so much greater. Think of all the dangerous things that you can see online that could traumatize your kid. Child porn, ISIS beheading videos, Donald Trump's Twitter account. <laughs> Beyond the stats though, this shroud of silence ruins lives. Lives of people like Jessica Cleland, who in rural Victoria at 8 a.m. on Easter Sunday two years ago took her life. No one could figure out why Jessica had acted so drastically until her parents looked through her phone and computer and found evidence of systematic, horrific bullying. On the night before she passed away, 87 abusive messages had been sent to her by two abusers. It's the lives of people like Amanda Todd, the 15-year-old Canadian who had a topless photo unwillingly distributed around her school, who also took her life. This might sound severe, but it's common. 20% of child cyberbullying victims contemplate suicide, and one in 10 attempt it. Allowing parents to watch over this type of misdeed is a simple, common-sense extension of their role. A parent has to sign off of almost every single aspect of a child's life. I had to get my mom's permission to do this debate, and we both knew that unless the opposition were particularly strange, I wasn't exactly gonna get bullied or be subject to unwanted sexual solicitation. <laughs> Nearing the end of this debate, though, it's clear that something needs to be done to stem the abuse. The opposition might try to get away with saying that parents have no clue what they're doing and just won't be able to help, even if they do have the tools. But it's pretty obvious that almost all parents these days are more technologically literate than the opposition has tried to say. The vast majority of you here have Facebook, even if you only use it to post embarrassing photos of your kids every now and then. So what tools do you have at your disposal? You can block, filter, and monitor content without even trying. Devices like Circle with Disney can tell you which websites a child visits, tells you how long a child has been on each website, and allows you to restrict access or amount of time a child is allowed online or on a specific website. You can download software that does the same thing. You can track your kid's location. The Find My Friends app that is on the iPhone you have can do this. And if my mum can figure out how to use it, it mustn't be very hard to understand and use it all. 
According to Pew Research, 39% of you already take similar measures. This is not some alien, hyper-technical process. Ultimately, I have faith in the mums and dads of the world to figure out how to make sure their kid is safe, as they do every single day in so many other ways already. Let's go back to that hypothetical from the beginning. Your kid goes onto her laptop in her room. Her door is closed. She is there for hours. You have in front of you a device that would allow you to check which sites she's visiting and to check whether she is safe. You find yourself asking the same question that you always ask yourself. Is my child safe? And you know that there's only one way to get the answer. So you check up on her because it's your responsibility to do so. Because that child's claim to privacy does not mean she should be put in harm's way. And because ultimately, that's what you would do in the real world. Privacy is not for children. Ladies and gentlemen, Max finished his speech by saying, I want to know if my child is safe, and there's only a way to find out, by checking in on them. What he actually meant was that, apparently, there's only one way to tell if your child is safe, by spying on them. I beg to differ. I think there are other ways. For example, talking to your child. So, I have three questions at the end of this debate. Firstly, who is best equipped to determine privacy? Secondly, how do we best protect our children's safety? And finally, how do we ensure that our children actually become functional adults in the real world? So let's look at this first question. We'd say on the negative team that privacy is something that has been evolving over the last few generations. We think that it's different and the conceptualization of it has changed from you know, Sulet's age to my age, and to even younger people who, sorry, who are <laughs> um, 11 or 12, some of the students that I teach now. But I'd say that also, parents have a tendency to be incredibly overcautious. If they're looking at their child's internet history, they are almost always going to say, that's not okay, even if it is something that the child can look at safely, because parents always have that need to overprotect their child. What do you, why do we think that's a bad thing? We think it's really bad because it means that we as parents are now forcing our outdated views on our child. We're restricting their development and their ability to progress in an increasingly um, less conservative society. We think that's a really bad thing. But more than that, we'd say that children are digital natives in today's society. They're more likely to know the privacy settings to protect themselves from strangers. They're able to block people that they don't like. They're able to see when someone is trying to groom them and talk to their parents about it, right? And here's my question. Who's more likely to post um, a Google search or a private message as a Facebook status? A 13-year-old or a 73-year-old, right? I'd say the 73-year-old. Not that I have anything against 73-year-olds. So, the second idea is how do we best protect our children's safety? And what we've heard from the opposition a lot is that children don't understand the risks of technology. Um, they're going to be groomed and taken in by predators. We'd say that, yes, these risks are real, but they existed before technology and they'll exist after te technology. It's not something that is only purely social media. But more than that, the rates of um, child sexual abuse have decreased over the last 20 years. It is not something that is increasing. It's something that we think is increasing because we're increasingly aware of it, because we have more discussions. And that means that our children in today know about these groomers. You ask an average 13-year-old and they know people are sexual predators online and I should block them, right? Kids are not stupid. More than that, though, we'd say that we can continue to educate these kids and that education and using technology in a safe way is not the same as violating privacy. We can teach them to use privacy technology like encryption, teach them not to, t um, to talk to unsavory characters and to talk to their parents if they're uncomfortable or have questions. Then we were told, really, basically, the gist is that we need to protect our children. Sure, the parents are governing the children. Let me ask you something. The government wants to protect us. Would you, as citizens, be okay with the government reading your emails, reading your mail, reading your private messages to protect you from yourself or from other people in Australia? I'd say probably most of us say no. But more than that, we want to ask, how do you think children are going to respond 
right? Because children are not passive agents in their upbringing. Children have their own opinions. And we think the most likely thing that's going to happen, especially in their teenage years, is that they'll resent and they'll rebel, right? That means they're not going to ask you for help if they do have problems, because you don't trust them, so why should they trust you? Secondly, it means that they're going to hack into the systems that you put up. Thirdly, it means that they're going to go to other sources. Incognito mode is a real thing, yeah? Bathrooms are a real thing. If they're not allowed to go on technology in their bedroom, they'll go in the bathroom. They'll go somewhere else. They'll go to their friend's house. Those issues are real, and it means that if your child is in danger, now you have no recourse. You have no ability to help them. More than that, if your child is having issues, say a teenager with an STI or who's having a mental issue, and they're not comfortable talking to their parents about it, if they now know that their parents are going to be monitoring all of their search activity, they have no avenue. They have nothing they can turn to. And we think that that's a much greater harm than that small potential risk of a predator online. Finally, I want to talk about how we ensure that our children become functional adults. What we've heard is that a good parent is someone who's with their children and monitor their children at all times. But we'd say that the role of a parent isn't just to protect a child's safety. It's to ensure that they can function within society. And what that means is that they need to be able to learn, to think critically and develop as their own individuals. They need to be able to um, access information, explore interests and research um, questions that they might not want to ask adults. This allows them to not only develop the critical thinking skills they need to protect themselves in the long term, but it also means that they have the ability to take responsibility for their own choices. They have some self-determination and the ability to develop a sense of autonomy and self-esteem. Because if you don't have that, you're constantly restricted and you never really feel like you can develop as your own individual. So what I say is that a child is still a person. And I'm going to quote Dr. Seuss here. Because a person is a person, no matter how small. I think we can agree that as adults, what we want for our children is for them to be well-adjusted individuals who can protect themselves, who value responsibility, who value trust, and who value respect. How can we ever expect our children to have those ideals and to develop those traits if we never give them responsibility, if we never show them trust, and if we never show them respect? So what I'd say today is that education is very important. But the way that we protect our children and the way that we ensure that they are able to function in society is by talking to them and not spying on them. Thank you. We're going to find out the result of the poll that was taken before the debate began. Undecided, 27%. For the motion, 40%. And therefore, with a very respectable position to argue for against the motion was 33%. So plenty of opportunity for movement, which could resolve in win or loss, depending on how the arguments unfold. Can I ask, um, where did this statistic come from then about the relative or absolute and decline? And you might clear that up in relation to levels of violence and abuse. So that statistic comes from the um, sexual register of criminal offenders. I might have gotten the words wrong just then, um, but if you look it up online, you can definitely find that, that it's been decreasing. <laughs> well, you, you, you were particularly frowning, I noticed, from that, Susan. So why were you frowning? I was frowning because that's not the reality of what um, goes on. I have never heard of the sexual register of sexual offending. I don't even know what that is. Um, and the premise that kids can pick a predator is just ridiculous because if they could pick a predator, they wouldn't get groomed. Um, these people are very successful at what they do, but you speak to any law enforcement, um, you speak to anyone that works in the child exploitation field, and they will talk about the fact that they are run off their feet. The internet gives rise to a new um, avenue to groom children. A predator doesn't have to groom the parent to get to the child, it's directly to the child. The parent is out of the equation. It's very easy. And, um, yeah, that, that's just not the reality. If you talk to law enforcement, they're seeing a marked increase. Not just, a, not just an awareness, a public increase in public awareness. No. But an actual... And look, with domestic violence, yes, we know that there was a marked increase in of domestic violence instance, in 
instances because people were more reporting. We know that that's a fact. Um, but certainly with the um, child predation and the sexual offending against children, there's a marked increase in that. Okay, Never let's, before have they let's been go to the microphone too. I'll start the clock and I'll give you a ding if your minute's up. Yeah. Um, my name's Tamara. I had a question about the physical development of a child's brain. I think you mentioned it, Susan, and I wanted to understand, you, you said I think it was 20 before a child has got the ability to manage these kind of issues. I just wanted to check, is that correct? I think if you talk to medical scientists, they talk about early to mid-20s for females and closer to 30 for males. Now, that doesn't mean that they're That's not functioning. Generous. Yes, it's being generous. Um, that's not meaning they're not a fully functioning adult prior to that, but I think the, the medical science talks about the fact that that's roughly when the brain, all the parts kick in, fully form, and essentially you are a fully formed adult. Um, we all know people in their 40s that act like kids, yeah. and we know 15-year-olds that are far more mature than a 25-year-old. And Beatrice, you want to comment on that? Do you? I just can I add one thing. On. Sorry, oh. I just wanted, the reason I was really asking is because I like this idea that you slowly introduce children to this concept and let them manage the space themselves. But if they physically can't do it, then surely that's not possible. To okay, so that's a, that's the old philosophical maxim that ought implies can. So. Mm -hmm. If you can't do it, what's the situation? Beatrice, on this? Um, so I've got two points. The first would be, if the only basis we have for di like diving into people's emails and reading them without their permission is because their brains aren't developed enough, does that mean that we should be doing that until they're the age of 25? And the second question I have is, if a 16-year-old is legally allowed to have sex, why can't they manage their own conversations? Okay, thank you. Microphone two. So for me, most of the inappropriate or questionable images I've seen of underage people online are posted by their parents. And I think we're going to have this <laughs> a whole generation of people who um, their entire life is already online without their permission, sometimes from their literal birth. Um, so if we're going to say that children don't have privacy under the whole premise of keeping them safe, how can parents do that when they've breached their privacy publicly since the day they're born? Okay, so, yeah. Oh, look, feel free to clap these people, yeah. <laughs> Embarrassing photos of your children. We'll just go back to the microphone one and then we'll try and draw these things together. I guess this is a slippery slope. Please just take this lightly. But the idea that you raise, for example, these children, say you were to win, the four was to win, and you raise your children under this assumption that they can be watched at any given time because they are children, and then they become adults, and then companies, governments, places say that, you know, we're just doing this for your safety. It's the same reasoning that they were raised and brought up with and suddenly this is something that they are just accustomed to. Is that something you're willing to live with? The idea that they might be accustomed to being, their privacy being breached even when they're adults. Right, so are we conditioning, yeah, please clap. It's fascinating, are we? No, not yet. But the question is, are we conditioning people to accept breaches of privacy? Last two people at microphone two briefly, and then I'm going to invite the panel to start summing up and to incorporate some of these things in response. Last word to you, sir. Hi there. Uh, my name's Chris. Um, I think we can all agree in this debate that the key point is education of our kids and the kind of parent-child trust relationship. But the main concern I had that wasn't addressed um, was that you know, often we don't know what all of the risks are and it's, it's very difficult to, you know, educate a child to the point where they know everything that they might possibly be exposed to. So how can we expect a child to come and have a conversation with us when they don't know that what they're doing or what they're getting themselves into could be harmful? Thank you. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, uh, just to warn you, in a moment you'll see, probably about four minutes, ballot boxes coming down and you've all got little voting slips, They're usually behind your shoulder on your seat if you haven't got it already. And when you vote, this will be much more formal than the pre-debate poll, you can cast your ballot by either tearing it in half and putting for or against, and we're not going to do it just yet. Or if you're, not un if you're not decided, just leave them joined together and that'll count as an undecided vote. Now, I'd ask, you, I'd ask each of the speakers in the order in which they spoke to speak for up to two minutes giving their summation and addressing some of these unresolved questions. For example, I'd really like to hear someone from the negative respond to the story of the person who said at 24 and they're addicted to porn if only my parents had intervened. And I'd really like to hear somebody along the way here address those 
last two couple of points about conditioning students and younger people potentially to be indifferent or complacent about surveillance from the state. Susan, your two minutes begins now. All right, so I think that whilst we need to ensure that young people have safe and positive experiences when they use technology, leaving them to their own devices is not the way to go. And it is not about undue monitoring and watching and surveillance. Uh, we also obviously have to be careful that we're not breaching the, you know, the Listening Devices Act and things like that. So we don't want parents engaging in criminal activity themselves. But I think the comment um, that was made about the private email going back and forth or the private chat really is a misnomer because in reality, the intention that it was private is not what we see. It can be taken, it be, can be used, it can be shared with or without our permission. I don't think it's conditioning children, it's teaching them the facts of the matter. We're not making it up, nor are we embellishing the truth. But the reality is when you put it online, you've lost control over it. Your intention of who reads it and where it goes is not always matched by reality. And we have to understand that cyberspace is a public place, not a private space. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sue Let Dreyfus, two minutes. So um, the first thing I'd say is that the idea that everything you post online is not private is actually not accurate. Um, I can say this as a technologist. So you can post things to one other person or to a group of people. You can do so using encryption, and it is actually private. Um, do you lose control over it? Well, obviously, when you say anything to anyone, you lose a little bit of control, but it's not the same thing as posting something openly on Facebook, and that's the whole point of what we're saying. The whole point of what we're saying is that technology, while being somewhat of the enemy, as described by this is how you know, pedophiles and groomers can find children, can also be the solution. It can be the solution through blockers and filters, but it can also be the solution through privacy technologies. But the only way it's going to be the solution is if you actually can train your children to use them. And to do that, they have to trust you and respect you. And they're much less likely to do that if you're spying on them all the time. And that's particularly true of a teenager. So I think that that critical issue of technology being able to actually control things that are online so your posts are private is a really important one. And the other element of that is not just the actual technology, but how you adapt the technology that already exists, which may be half public and half private. So for the example that Beatrice used about you know, limiting access to certain members of her family who might want to access her Facebook account, that's actually a question not of learning encryption technology, but of learning setting variation. Again, another important thing. Um, are we conditioning people not to be able to handle privacy if we don't train them, for example, as teenagers? Yes, absolutely. One of the biggest concerns I have is that we are going to you know, potentially have a situation if we over nanny state children by surveying them all the time and spying on them and you know sucking up all their conversations and demanding that you get access to their messages is you end up with a situation of some 18 year old who actually thinks it's normal to live in a big brother world. That's me nanny stating you, Sula. Thank you. <laughs> Liz, your two minutes. Spying is actually not a word that we have used at all in this debate. That is something that the opposition has accused us of suggesting that we should do, which is not what we have presented. We've suggested that online privacy is not a thing. It's impossible. Um, I agree with the question around uh, parents bre breaching privacy of sharing their kids' pictures online, and in fact, it's one of the things that both Susan and I are consistently saying on social media, parents, please stop sharing images of your children because you cannot control where they go. The reality is, is that those images are used all the time by groomers, even heads of kids posted and taken off and put on naked pictures of other pedophile children. The reality is that there is no such thing as online privacy if it is online. It is in a public space. Um, the suggestion that young people are faring really well is, is actually a little bit of a, a conflict there because so many of our young people are experiencing mental health issues uh, as they post technology online, as they are constantly looking for the next um, like for their image that they post online so that they can get another hit of dopamine to feel good about themselves 
All of this is public behavior that's framing the way that they're thinking about themselves and that the way that they're seeing their identity. So there is no such thing as privacy online. Everything that we post is public. Thank you. Tim Dean. Look, I've got to say, I'm actually rather heartened to hear members of the affirmative supporting our position that parents should not be spying on their children, uh, that parents should not be surveilling their children without their knowledge. That is precisely our point. So I think we can at least agree on that, although there is only one ticket that represents that, just letting you know. Um, <laughs> another point that I would like to make is that anecdote is not the same as data. We need to look at empirical evidence about these things and there will always be individual cases and there will be outliers and as troubling and shocking as they may be, what we need to look at is the overall picture. This is because I think it's a misnomer to suggest that we can eliminate risk entirely. It is a vain pursuit for anybody to attempt to eliminate risk. If we do that and those who attempt to do that, well, we call them helicopter parents. We, we understand the dangers that they represent to their children and to their autonomy, and that is central to what we are talking about uh, tonight. So what I would say is that our fundamental point is that we know the internet can be dangerous. We know that sharing can be dangerous. We support restriction and we, uh, we support education and parental involvement but we deny that that is the same as spying. We think that any time there is surveillance without the children knowing, whenever there is a breach of their autonomy, that is causing more harm than good. Thank you, Tim. Now, Max, I'm hoping you're going to tell us definitively now whether there is on your side a view that there may be occasions when it's appropriate, even responsible, to look at your children's behaviour without their consent or knowledge. And however you define that, that's what I'd like to know. So your two minutes starts now. Absolutely. I just want to firstly quickly say our aim isn't to eliminate risk, it's to just minimise it in a way which is way better than you guys. And I think that's what we're able to do. <laughs> so I'll ask three questions that hopefully clear that up. The first is this one that um, Simon brought up about this question of whether it's moral for parents to do things to kids without their knowledge. And that was this moral standpoint that you guys had throughout the debate. I told you a few things in my speech that were perhaps a bit implicit, but I want to explicitly tell you some things that parents do to kids at the moment without those kids' knowledge. It's things like going into their room without asking for permission before you go into their room. It's things like completely controlling every single thing that they eat without kids going to the grocery store with you and being like, no, I don't want that vegetable. Yes, I do want that chocolate milk. It's things like even more significant things. You get to decide what school your kid goes to, often with no input from them. So what that means is that that test of, are parents allowed to do things without a kid's knowledge in order to make them have a better life? The answer is yes, that they are allowed to. And we think that's an extension, of this outside is an extension of the parent's role. The second thing I want to touch on is, which side will be able to educate children better? We think that um, we're going to be able to do this simply because when you're able to see the types of harms that, that kids are facing, you're able to tailor your parenting much, much more. Because you can't cover every single harm that our kid is going to face. So you can see if they've searched up porn and they're 10 years old, you can have a chat about them, about the porn to them. And notably that happens hopefully before they're being groomed so they have that basis of education. Um, and then the last question is, what about this child's development? Is this conditioning them to live with surveillance? And I think obviously it just isn't. They can still develop as a person. You know, your parents aren't going to read every single text message. If they did, it would be really boring. Um, they have the ability to develop offline in like the huge ways that they do so already, but also morally. Parents like, control the way you develop in so many ways. This is a very fair extension of this. The ultimate question of, is my child safe? It's clear that under our side, children are safer. And um, thank you, Max. And a special round of applause for a man breaking from his HSC to come and help public debate. Okay, Beatrice, now I'm going to put you um, the same kind of challenge. I want this, this notion about never is a parent able to intervene without the child's knowledge and consent? So what I'd say is that, sure, sometimes parents do things without their kids' knowledge, but how do the kids respond to that? When you force them to eat cauliflower, are they happy? Probably not. 
I'd say that when you have a relationship and as when we as a society encourage um, environments where children feel comfortable enough and respected enough to actually discuss these issues um, voluntarily to have frequent open discussions where they can identify issues together with their parents. We think those are the kinds of um, relationships where you have spontaneous disclosure, where you have parents actually getting actual information from their child, not what their child just plants in messages so that the parents are happy. But also, it's, um, you know, it's much better than when their parents are trying to force information from them, trying to talk to their friends or control their environments. Because in those situations, kids are always going to rebel, or at the very least, they're going to resent their parents. So we think it's much better to have times where you're working together as a parent and child in your relationship, rather than some kind of Orwellian you know, hierarchy where the parent is boss all the time. And we think that's where you get the safest um, and the most effective environment. Um, especially because I'd say that parents don't always know absolutely what's right. So you need to have that back and forth, rather than the parents just pushing their ideals on the child. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. The results are incredibly close, really, because the debate now is 43% for the motion, but against has won with 49% of the vote. So I declare the motion lost. I look forward to seeing you next year. My name's Simon Longstar from the Ethics Centre, and goodbye from me and everyone here at Angel Place. <laughs>